meeting is now being recorded. All right, so I have to remind myself. So here we go. We are recording. And now uh, Dale Brown will be. We talked about the uh, proposed reorganization of the Transportation Working Group. Dale, can you? Uh, Dale, can can you say something? I don't see Dale connected. So uh, let's see. We may have some difficulties here, but. Uh, well, so I can go over this. So uh, there are three co-chairs in the Transportation Working Group, uh, Derek Rojas, and okay, uh, I need to unmute you. Let's see. All right, let me uh, unmute everyone. All guests have first. been unmuted. And then now I... All guests have been again. muted. So, uh, well, let me unmute everyone again. And, All guests uh, have been talk. unmuted. All right. Yeah, Jack Wing, I also received all your chats. Uh, well, and uh, what? Well, yeah, sorry for about the uh, the charts being a little bit uh, uh, unclear. But uh, Dale, can you? Yep, Dale. Now you can say something. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. I'll just spend a very few minutes on this. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, we, we've tried to reorganize the transportation working group in a functional uh, manner. And we thought that the four, well, five key functions that we've got are products, events, services that, that we provide, and, of course, membership to try to keep the membership alive, and then the communications between uh, the working group, which is important since we're we're, we're trying to um, share resources and, of course, volunteer resources are always scarce. Everybody's being asked to do all kinds of volunteer work on top of their normal 12-hour day jobs. So that's that's what we've come up with, and we're focusing in products on, on a newsletter, uh, working on some standards, hopefully co, co-working with, with the other working groups on some of that, and also uh, case studies. Then, of course, we've got the events, which is IW and IS, and then, of course, this, this webinar series. And uh, thanks again to Hokey for, for getting this organized in conjunction with Oliver, who's, they're, they're both cross-communicating with the other working groups. Um, and we're still looking for volunteers to fill in. Oh. Okay, I think the mute went on for a second, but uh, yeah. anyway... That's the basic concept is, is five functional areas. We've got some directors at large from, from two of the large transit agencies to mentor and provide uh, some counseling and, and what are the needs of the industry sort of viewpoint. And then we've got three co-chairs um, trying to keep uh, all the sectors, if we can, involved. So we've got Anita from the, the UK who will be, I, I think this will be her last year. She's been doing the TWG for quite a number of years, and uh, uh, myself and uh, David on the other coast. Uh, so that's pretty much it, and I'll turn it back to you, uh, Hoagie. Thank you. And uh, also, Dale, can you talk about the uh, International uh, Symposium in oh. uh, Washington, D.C. in July? Yeah. Okay. Can you still hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, looking forward. To, we'll have our We'll have our flyer. I think it'll be out tomorrow. Uh, I'm hoping and uh, and looking forward to seeing seeing everybody in Washington. We are trying to uh, connect with WMATA to do a technical tour, followed by a joint working session with the APTA, the American Tran- uh, Passenger Transit um, Association. So if if we can work with them on actually creating a systems integration standard. We've got permission to do that. We just need a an MOU from from Incozy between the two organizations to make it official. But uh, we're we're trying to get that organized as a possible tour on the Wednesday. Um, so there'll be invitations and and some sort of a sign up RSVP system set up for that. So stay tuned. It's mentioned on our flyer, and we're looking forward to seeing everybody in Washington on July seventh. All right. Thank you, Dale. 
And now, uh, well, enough housekeeping item, please, uh, please post your questions uh, to the uh, check box uh, in the uh, left-hand side. And I've seen uh, Jack Ring uh, post a few questions already. So uh, here's Jesse. Well, Jesse, can you, uh, are you, are you muted or unmuted? Uh, I'm here. Are you hearing me? All right. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yep, you can uh, take over and you can uh, progress the slides if you want. Yeah. Okay. I'll try that. If not, I'll, I'll look to you. So, um, welcome, everybody. Um, as Toki said, we're going to, uh, and I are going to be talking about using Agile Scrum methods uh, for Intelligent Transportation Systems, or ITS. Um, Here's the presentation topics. I'm not going to go over this in any detail, uh, uh, but I, I will cover the, these three questions. What is ITS? Uh, how has it evolved in the past? What's in the future? And the role of systems engineering in, um, in general uh, for, with regards to Agile. Uh, Barbara then will look at the other items. Uh, and again, in the interest of time, I will move on. So uh, for those that are not familiar with uh, ITS, the uh, question is, what is it? Uh, the short answer is technology in transportation. The official US DOT definition is uh, shown in red here. It, ITS means electronics, communications, or information processing uh, used to improve the efficiency or safety of a surface transportation system. That's a very, very broad definition. It was written about 20 years ago uh, when electronics was uh, playing a much smaller role in smartphones had not yet uh, reached the marketplace. Uh, I'll note that this does exclude boats, planes, and most uh, rail facilities other than uh, urban rail. Um, <clears throat> the federal important for uh, some folks who are working on federally funded projects is that federal regulations do apply to those federally funded projects. And I think it's obvious to everybody uh, that um, ITS is heavily dependent upon IT resources. So let's take a quick look in the past and, a, and then another uh, quick look into the future. If you look back 50 years, uh, you'll see a car of that era on the left and now we, a car on the right. Uh, th that typifies a trans uh, transition that is ha in the midst of happening now. Um, a good, there's a good quote from the Kinsey Company uh, on this. Uh, and it said, uh, your last car is a hardware-operated machine. Your next car will be a software-driven electronic device. And I think the car on the right uh, is a good harbinger of that. So uh, transportation technology, or ITS, is at least 100 years old. Some of the first devices as shown in these pictures. Um, the, the real impetus began around the 1970s when technology started to get used for freeway traffic management in a significant way in the U.S., and here's several of the field devices that I suspect all of you have seen um, in the past that were the beginnings of ITS in freeway management. Uh, and moving forward 10 years, arterial traffic management, city streets, uh, surface streets, uh, uh, saw a kind of a new development renaissance in the 80s uh, for coordinating or synchronizing traffic signals, generally along a major roadway, major arterial uh, with traffic signals. In the 1990s, we saw development of centralized traffic management centers where all of the information from the intersections and the other devices out on the freeways came into a central site and people actively then started managing the transportation system using the, the remote surveillance and control facilities that were built into the traffic management centers with communication out to the field devices. 2000s, we saw a big wave of smart buses, putting a lot of technology onto buses. And nowadays, most buses, uh, especially in the urban areas, are equipped with m most or all of the stuff you see on this chart. Also in the 2000s, we saw traveler information uh, explode, uh, providing information to travelers, motorists, uh, transit users uh, to help them avoid problems. Uh, themselves and to avoid contributing to getting in the queue on the roads or uh, at, at transit stations uh, if there is a problem with a capacity, a temporary problem. In the 2010s, the current, <clears throat> the current era, uh, we're seeing, a, uh, again, a, a real proliferation of electronic tolling 
open road tolling uh, is also what it's called, and high occupancy toll lanes uh, getting very popular in a certain in, in a number of urban areas. Of course, this is very heavily dependent on technology, extremely heavily. Also in this era, we've seen a, you know, a, a, a great number of mobile device apps that have enabled a lot of trans, new transportation services that really weren't practical without a, a ubiquity of mobile devices in every, all the travelers' hands. So you see traffic and navigation, of course, everyone uses that, I'm sure. Parking information and guidance and even reservation of parking spaces ahead of time, uh, ride hailing and carpooling. Dynamic carpooling, all of those are some, a few examples of many of these. Uh, meanwhile, at the institutional level, several important things happened. <clears throat> In the mid-90s, the U.S. Department of Transportation created a national ITS architecture, a framework, if you will, for integration of transportation systems. Um, the goal was to define a standard, a national interoperable ITS framework that would guide future transportation systems. And of course, it was built heavily, uh, totally on system engineering concepts and terminology. So in the late 1990s, early 2000, a US DOT issued uh, the ITS architecture and system engineering rule, as, as the terminology goes in the regulatory world. Um, if, if for those who want the chapter and verse, it's in uh, Title 23 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 940. It defined what is an ITS uh, project and, and what is ITS. That's the definition we just heard. Uh, it required every urban area to develop a regional ITS architecture of their own. And more importantly for this group, it required a system engineering analysis be performed uh, for all substantial ITS projects. And that's in subsection 11 of 940. Uh, it defines some system engineering concepts and and terminology that are still widely used today. And for those from outside the uh, ITS world, uh, it did drew, draw heavily on aerospace and uh, IT concepts and terminology. And in fact, some of the people from those fields uh, were uh, the early pioneers of ITS architecture and systems engineering. So for many of you, uh, you can see the um, the very common system engineering V process, this is uh, bread and butter for ITS, uh, it is used for most high-risk ITS projects. It is not a required project. Others, you know, from waterfall to agile and other uh, other options are, are possible, but the large majority have been using the V process. And USDOT generally encourages this unless there's a good reason to use something else, in which case that, that is okay. So here's my observations from this uh, uh, brief history. Uh, ITS projects are becoming increasingly complex, uh, multi-agencies, multimodal, multi-purpose. There's more people in the control loop. And perhaps most importantly, the requirements for new systems are much less foreseeable than they used to be in the past, uh, especially with mobile devices in the hands of uh, thousands of users uh, there's a wide variety in the way people will use them and the, even in their use cases. So requirements are much less foreseeable than they have been in the past. Also, there's a major shift uh, from the focus on hardware in the past. There's more and more software. And software development, as I think everyone on the phone knows, uh, is, is difficult to manage. It requires a lot of maintenance and uh, ever-evolving uh, security threats as well. So the bottom line there is we need more flexible development tools to respond to these uh, changing patterns. So what's in the future? How will we uh, be applying these tools? Well, this is what my crystal ball says. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, everyone's heard about self-driving or autonomous individ uh, vehicles. Uh, this is being developed almost exclusively under private sector leadership, automakers, electronic companies, uh, of course, new uh, new starts as well, but 99% uh, under private uh, sector leadership. On the other hand, uh, the vehicles will also be connected to each other and to the uh, surrounding world um, on freeways, for example. This is being done on primarily under U.S. DOT leadership, uh, but with substantial participation from the private sector as well. So they'll be connected to each other on freeways, uh, for example, 
obvious reasons to avoid crashes for safety purposes, but also some efficiency benefits and increased capacity. Similarly, on surf streets for uh, avoiding crashes with uh, other vehicles and, and with other objects as well, it's called V2V or vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication is the jargon you'll hear. Similarly, the uh, vehicles will be connected to the roadway, to the infrastructure, uh, for, for example, the traffic signals. <clears throat> uh, and that's generally referred to in shorthand as vehicle to infrastructure, V2I. And <clears throat> ultimately, many other things will be part of the system. Uh, uh, vehicles to pedestrians, especially uh, p vulnerable pedestrians that are uh, limited in sight or mobility. Um, uh, bicycles, uh, uh, wheelchairs, uh, uh, the number of possibilities are, are uh, great. Uh, that's generally referred to as V to X, where X stands for anything and everything. Uh, lastly, uh, an important item here is the vehicles must cooperate if they're, we're going to achieve these benefits. Uh, so, uh, for example, this is a picture of a platoon for an actual automated highway demonstration that was done about 20 years ago in San Diego. And you can imagine if we're going to get the benefits of the increased, greatly increased capacity by having cars move close to each other, as this photo shows, or this is a real-life photo, um, then they have to cooperate when someone needs to join the queue, uh, needs to join the platoon, they have to open up, make space, etc. So cooperation is an important element of this uh, vision of the future automation, for especially for automobiles. And I can't say that here in Los Angeles all of our drivers are fully cooperative on the freeway. Uh, so my prediction then uh, for looking forward 50 years after looking back 50 years, um, vehicles, especially automobiles, will be automated. They will be connected as well. They will be cooperating. And probably they will be electric vehicles. And in that future, we'll have no traffic congestion, no crashes, no air pollution. Um, no greenhouse gas uh, emissions, uh, no driving stress, and the mobility for uh, all, including those who uh, don't have great mobility right now because of um, uh, they're young or they're old or have uh, uh, some sort of disability that prevents them from, uh, from driving. So are we at that utopia yet? No, but uh, I, th I guarantee we will be by 2068. So to help us get there, USDOT has developed a report uh, I stress that it's not official guidelines or policy, but an information report that um, uh, focuses on helping people who are new to Agile and in particular to Agile Scrum methods uh, and uh, how, how to help them learn how to apply that to ITS projects. Uh, the name and number of the report is here if you want to do a, a search uh, to find it, but also there is a link uh, on the screen, should be a hot link, that uh, will get you directly to that report. You can download a, P a PDF um, and have it immediately available as well. A couple of, uh, of uh, thanks and kudos. The uh, USD, USDOT development team included these three uh, individuals. I'm not going to read every one of these names, but um, <clears throat> our colleagues on the NOVA side who did the heavy lifting here are listed as well. Barbara's going to uh, take the baton here shortly, and also from Consistex, uh, several of our colleagues. Very importantly, though, we have to thank TWG for getting this whole thing started. Uh, two years ago, a number of folks uh, launched a webinar at uh, IW, I believe it was, in February, um, uh, titled Agile for ITS. Uh, it was these folks, Simon Smith, uh, Phyllis Marbot, Jean Souza, uh, Jen Russell, and I hope I'm not leaving anybody out, but big thanks to them because we had almost 200 USDOT people around the country tuning into that, and as a result, USDOT headquarters took the initiative to launch the development of this report, which we're now telling you is available uh, and, uh, and hopefully will serve well for adopting Agile within the ITS world. So thank you uh, many times over to TWG and to these these folks in particular who are terrific in making it all happen. So with that, I will pass the baton to Barbara electronically at this point. And uh, Hoki, can you switch over the charts? And Barbara, if you could pick up. 
Yeah, Barbara can uh, start uh, right away. Yep. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, good morning from Washington, D.C. I'm Barbara Staples. I was the principal investigator for the report project, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the uh, TWIG webinar series, and thank you to everyone for joining today. You know, uh, Jesse just showed you a slide of our team members, and because most of us were not um, agile experts, m many of us were systems engineers or transportation engineers, our two agile experts on the team gave us a tutorial on Agile and Scrum, and we all decided to help us to really appreciate Agile and to better understand it. We would follow, and, and this is air quotes, an Agile-like approach in developing the project deliverables. And so what that included was um, the development team. We had biweekly stand-ups and sprint reviews every two weeks, and we would bring in the Federal Highway team. And we all found it very beneficial. Um, so much that when our certified Scrum Master went on maternity leave, we found that we weren't really following the Scrum practice as much as we were really supposed to. So based on our experience, I would say if you're going to do this, you really do need to have a certified Scrum Master. Uh, they'll they'll, they'll uh, hold your feet to the fire and make you follow the practice and the rules. Okay, uh, the purpose of today, again, is to introduce you to this recently developed report and the concepts. I'm going to explain why Federal Highway developed the report. Uh, Jesse kind of gave you some information earlier, why it's important, and I'm going to highlight what the document provides. I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of detail today, one, because we just don't have the time, and two, we, all of us on the team, the development team and the federal folks, we want people to download the document and read it and take a look at it. So we hope that we will whet your appetite today and that you will be able to um, get a hold of the document and take a look at it. So um, some of the content is going to be ITS specific. Je uh, Jesse mentioned about the Rule 940.11, so there is going to be that. But um, even if you don't work in ITS in the field, um, if you work with large systems, integrating subsystems, we believe that some of the approaches and concepts um, may be applicable and hopefully you'll find them useful. Okay, this document was initiated by Federal Highway, again, to provide a concerted response to questions that they were, they were getting about using Agile methodology specifically on Scrum. And this is in recognition that Scrum methods are being used on IT developments, and for the foreseeable future, we believe that that is going to continue. There's also a need for assistance on how to incorporate Scrum with traditional systems engineering for ITS project execution and the oversight, all of this within the, rule, the framework of the Rule um, 940.11. And there's also a need to get this information out and share it with the state and local transportation agencies. These are the people that are actually deploying the systems. So I'm hoping to manage some expectations that um, this was really developed for Federal Highway to meet their need to get information, share it within their staff, share it with the state and local agencies. This is the first information report, as Jesse pointed out. It's not guidance. It's not policy. And um, so there, there's that. That's why they did this. Okay, so compatibility with a, a rule. What I want to point out on this slide is that whatever we came up with in the report had to be compatible with the federal regulation. That is, it had to be compatible with what was stated in Rule 940.11. There are two primary systems engineering guidebooks. They're listed here on the slide. The report we developed doesn't replace these guidebooks but rather it is consistent with and complements the two guidebooks. Both guidebooks remain relevant and essential to the um, deployers. Both the guidebooks recommend the V model, and as we know, it, the V model is one of the best project delivery methods when long-term maintenance is required, when major, major physical components are being integrated, and safety risk must be minimized. And these are all characteristics of many ITS projects. But Agile development is emerging. It's here to stay. And it is definitely an effective method for software delivery. So the short of it is the B model is, is compatible with the rule. 
And we believe that Agile with Scrum is compatible with the rule when it's used within a proven V model context. So it's important to note that the V model and Scrum are not equivalent to each other, and that if uh, your project risk is going to go up if you just use Scrum and use Scrum to replace the V model. A little bit about the intended audience and warning, again, study that expectation. It, uh, the report was written with several audiences in mind. Later have a slide on the different chapters and who should read what. I'll show you that later on. But for the state and local agencies, these are the people that are actually fielding the systems. They will find descriptions of agile development and how it can be used on different ITS projects. And then for the federal highway staff at the division office, the resource centers, the, this document offers information on providing assistance for ITS projects that are going to use agile development and help with some oversight. And then there are the decision makers that um, are in both of these two groups at the executive level. And they really just need to know about this information, agile development, and combining it with systems engineering at a very high level. And then there's the contractors, the people that are going to be integrating and developing the system, and we believe that the technical um, information, the detailed information in the report is really for them. So you'll see over here on the right-hand side this warning symbol. Our team thought it was important to make this statement. Um, the report assumes that the reader has familiarity with systems engineering and also with agile methods. And we recommend that our readers take a look at the resources and tutorials in Appendix A and then really decide for themselves what information they need to pursue before going back to reading the report or just to keep reading the report. Okay, there's two key takeaways that we want to share with you. The first is that some projects where agile methods are appropriate and others where traditional systems engineering should be used. So you can see here on the slide, there are some characteristics for projects that are better suited to using Agile. A couple of examples include uh, your client uh, doesn't have a clear vision of what their product or the end goal should be, and they need to see something tangible. So Agile is really good to use here. You can uh, get feedback from your client, and you can put um, completed projects in front of them every two weeks, which is the typical length of a sprint. Perfecting human interfaces uh, that need user trials is also a good use for using Agile. And then functionality that can be delivered incrementally. And there's really something to be said about trying out something small and iterating through and seeing what works and what doesn't work and then see if it really validates your going in assumptions uh, about data models and performance about the system interfaces. So what are some characteristics of projects that are not suited to using Agile methods? Systems or system components that deal with safety critical or safety of life functions. Systems that require long-term maintenance or thoroughly documented project design. Remember that Agile doesn't place a high value on documentation. And for a lot of the ITS systems, it's very important to have the documentation to maintain those systems. And then also systems that consist of high levels of integrated disparate systems. Okay, the second uh, takeaway deals with challenges that need to be addressed about organizations adopting Agile methods. So first, consider the skill set, the staff knowledge, the resources that, in this case, Federal Highway has a state and local agency has. And remember that warning that I showed you a couple of slides earlier, having that experience, that knowledge of both Agile and systems engineering. And definitely know that Scrum has time commitments. The product to owner definitely would have um, to uh, be able to clear their calendar and devote a lot of time to supporting the project. Uh, next, contracting needs should be considered prior to making a decision to use Agile. If your agency's procurement uh, regulations process can't handle it, 
then maybe you shouldn't use a Scrum method. And then lastly, remember that Agile is new, at least to the ITS community, and the implementation is still evolving. So I don't know for some of you on the phone that maybe are not in the ITS community, um, maybe Agile has been around a lot, but this is kind of new up and coming in the ITS world. So you may be wondering, what are some benefits of combining, again, we're combining systems engineering and Scrum. And so here's some four benefits for you to consider. Combining systems engineering and Scrum can provide a holistic and cost-effective approach. We know that agile methods have the potential to speed up software development. And systems engineering focuses on reducing the risk of the total integrated system. So it's got that holistic view uh, that can reduce the life cycle schedule and the life cycle cost. Also, systems engineering brings rigor to projects while Scrum can execute and speed up the execution. A second benefit for you to consider is systems engineering provides a set of requirements for the overall system and allows for flexibility within the Scrum method. So that means the frequent reviews with the product owner that you get in the Agile process can potentially reduce the product risk. So that means you're getting that working piece of code, that frequent release of code in front of your client and getting the feedback on a regular basis. And the third benefit, it, uh, systems engineering brings comprehensive documentation that's needed for the safety critical functions and also, again, for maintaining the system. And lastly, requirements developed in the systems engineering portion can improve the communication between the development team and the test team. So in this um, case, a member of the systems engineering team can participate in the sprint planning and the sprint retrospective, maybe not so much in the daily scrum, but then again with the system integration. So there's communication between the systems engineering and the scrum development team throughout the life cycle. So what does the report cover? It explains one approach to how to use agile development as a complement to the systems engineering process. So again, we're focusing on combining agile with traditional engineering systems, engineering systems engineering, excuse me. And it consists of combining Scrum with a V model for a more holistic approach to developing complex systems. There could be other ways, and we're not saying this is the only way, but this is one approach that we have put in this information report and hope to get some feedback on it. The Agile approach is based on um, a report, Agile Systems Engineering Framework, defined by Matthew Kennedy, and it's also re reinforced by NASA, who is combining tailored engineering, um, excuse me, Agile methodologies with more traditional methods. So this combined approach identifies issues, it adds system level rigor and documentation that's needed to maintain a system for a long time. And I would say with ITS projects and ITS systems, 20 years is probably a good estimate of how long these systems are in the field. Okay, I hope you can see this all right. Um, this figure shows how Scrum can fit into the V model at the design, implementation, and unit testing stages. However, there's a range of entry and exit points where um, the V model um, and Scrum intersect. And it really depends on how much risk you're willing to have on your project. So the V model is used for the total system and then for additional development and implementation activities in separate units or subsystems. So the separate uh, subsystems and units are added to the overall system V. So notice the, uh, the V pattern here, and it kind of goes behind this green box, and then the Scrum pattern that's right here. Scrum is one of those possible additions to the V model. So in this large rectangle here, 
the Scrum method has three parts. Three parts. So the first one here over with the bright blue is an additional pre-activity for systems planning. And then here, hopefully you can see the green box that's behind here. This is the standard Scrum method. Nothing changed. It's, it's Scrum as you would find it anywhere else. And then this last piece, the muted blue over here, is an additional post-activity for system integration and retrospective. So when the Scrum is completed for the software product, it re-enters the V via the system integration activities. So the software development is performed within the Scrum while the overall planning and the high-level requirements and architecture development and the final product integration are performed using the V model. This combination ensures that the requirements and the design changes are documented and incorporated into the design, and then they're verified and validated. So section four of the report goes into greater detail about combining Scrum with systems engineering. And I should mention that on many of the slides, there is um, a section number that's over here in the bottom right, and that's where you can find more information in the report. Okay, how to use this document. This was the slide I talked about earlier. Uh, we listed out for the different um, audiences, but the bottom line is the consultants, the contractors, they really need to read the entire document. Okay, here's a quick look at the document table of contents. We have the standard introduction about the scope, the purpose, again, setting that expectation of this is for federal highway. And then we have section two that summarizes fundamentals of systems engineering, the V model. It describes Scrum methodology, and it introduces the concept of combining SE and Scrum. So this is the first time you're going to start seeing in the section 2.3 that's going to be followed up later on in Section 4 about combining systems engineering and Scrum. And then for Section 3, project managers can use this section to help to decide decision-making processes for when and where to use Scrum. So some of the uh, topics in there are why choose systems engineering only, uh, why combine systems engineering and Scrum, when to use and not to use Scrum, um, some initial Scrum considerations, suggestions for getting started with Scrum methodologies, and um, some challenges with applying Scrum and Agile uh, practices. Section 4 explains how Scrum and the V relate. Here, project managers can uh, use this section to consider how to fit Scrum methods in, into the overall V, which I just showed you. And in this section, we provide three examples. One is a very simple bike sharing system. And then uh, the last two are more complex. One is about a truck parking system. And there's two parts to that. There's one just using the V model only. And then there's one that shows combining Scrum with the V model. And then section five explains activities that will cut across the systems engineering agile some of the topics are stakeholder involvement, risk management, configuration management, uh, documentation, and traceability. And then understanding who does what in, in a system environment is one of the key concepts to success. And so Section 6 explains the roles and responsibilities in a combined Scrum and the model project. And one of the important topics that we mentioned in there is a proxy or a delegated proxy owner. Again, the product owner, whether it's at the federal highway or the state and local, is um, may not have the bandwidth um, that's going to be required of them so they can delegate. So, so we, we talk about the individual roles and we talk about some of the teams and the dynamics between the teams in Section 6. Section 7 identifies when and how to use Agile methods so it won't be in conflict with the rule 
940.11, again, this is one of those uh, sections that's very specific to the ITS community. And Section 8 talks about procurement options and um, contracting needs. It looks at different key issues for you to consider, tips and guidance. So this is geared towards the ITS community, but other people outside that domain may find this useful as well. And then lastly, in uh, Section 9, we uh, talk about the top 12 suggestions. Uh, examples are like making sure that your staff is properly trained, start small and have a scrum advocate, and use scrum to increase communication among the team members. And it also talks about some possible next steps for improving this document. So we don't show it, but there is a reference section. There's the Appendix A that links to the different resources, and there's an Appendix B that talks about the truck parking example that was introduced in Section 4. And so with that, I I may have gone a little bit over. Sorry, Hokey, but I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you. So uh, if you have questions, uh, you can post it on the uh, chat box right now. And I see uh, Jack has a few questions. Uh, let me go back up to his first one. Uh, from Jack, uh, Jack Wang, does the Agile development method produce Agile systems? Jesse, Blake, or Barbara can uh, chime in. Barbara, could you uh, take okay. a lead on that? Oh, okay, yes. Um, so, let's see. Does Agile development method, uh, particularly Scrum, produce Agile systems? Uh, my my response is not necessarily. To me, I believe that somebody would need to engineer it to result in a system that's going to be agile. And um, engineering agile systems really was not the focus of our project. There are a number of paper, papers that are available out there, and I'm happy to share those that um, that we have. But it was not the focus of this effort. Okay, uh, another question. Do Scrum methods result in fewer uh, latent bugs in the deployed system than other methods? Uh, again, I'll, I'll, um, I can re provide a response. I'm really not aware of any data that supports either claim for that. Um, Scrum focuses on short iterations of working software, and it does manage the risk, you know, with these frequent releases. So hopefully the bugs would be caught uh, during the Scrum development. Systems engineering methods, on the other hand, you know, do look at integration from the system level, and that's not really found or addressed in Scrum. So I think that a bug that's not found in the Scrum product could surface later on during the system integration. Okay, uh, another question. Does your Scrum effort detect the weak link in your development team? Hmm. Interesting question. I'll, I'll take another stab at that. Uh, so in the development team. So our approach to combine systems engineering and Scrum brings together the two teams, the, the people. And it brings together and, and builds upon the communication that you get from an Agile methodology. And hopefully with um, bringing the teams together and coordinating and having open dialogue, that would, that would help. Uh, Barbara, okay, if I could jump in, this is Jesse Glazer. Uh, one of the things the report stresses is that the team should be well prepared in the beginning, uh, that they should be prepared in terms of knowledge and also time availability or bandwidth, as Barbara said earlier. Uh, so I would say no, the met Scrum methodology doesn't fix uh, or even help identify weaknesses in the team, and probably quite the contrary, it may be it, it may be uh, exaggerated somewhat, but whatever methodology you use, having a qualified team with enough t 
time availability is just critical. And that's certainly true in Scrum as well as uh, the traditional system engineering methods. Can I uh, chime in here? This is Blake. Go ahead, Blake. Sure. Go ahead. Yes, I please. Jumped. I didn't know if I was getting through or not. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I think that question is also trying to address is uh, the agile process. When you see the wink link in the development team, you have a, you have the opportunity at each uh, uh, basically uh, scrum process to alter that team, and uh, it happens the same thing when you uh, the approach that systems engineering typically takes is you usually build a team around what your needs are. So the team is forming. Uh, it takes quite a while to form. On a uh, agile process, the team is very easily put together. But at the same go round, if you find a, a weak link there, and this is group dynamics we're dealing with now, uh, you, you have the opportunity after a... Uh, uh, scrum after a, the, the end of a two or four week uh, scrum process to make alterations uh, very quickly. I, mean, I think that was uh, possibly where that question was coming from. All right. Uh, in a matter of time, I will jump to the next question. Uh, slide 17. Need more agile systems engineering to devise uh, adequately autonomous swarms of vehicles. Uh, let me jump to 17. Oh, there you go. Uh, okay, this is Jesse. I, I don't really understand the question, uh, so perhaps Jack could clarify that. I'll be glad to come back to it. Okay. All right, so I jump to the next question. Uh, the V uh, concerns process, not results or quality. Are you saying the latter two are not important? The latter two are results or quality? Uh, Barbara, could you uh, take that? I, I would say we're not saying that at all. Uh, yeah. It wasn't, wasn't implied. Agreed. Barbara or Blake. I, 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 Go ahead, Blake. There's a lot. There's a lot of uh, methodologies that are built within the system engineering process to address quality to make sure quality is checked at multiple stages throughout the process. Uh, the uh, I'm not going to address the agile process as well because the agile experts uh, that helped us on there were emphasizing to us that they address that uh, within that with each scrum and particularly when they get into the testing with the uh, client or the representative, uh, making sure that that quality was there. That puts upon the designers the responsibility to make sure they adequately covered all the quality issues uh, within a scrum process. So I would say that there's just two different approaches to dealing with uh, quality that can be complementary to one another within the approach that's been presented. Uh, Blake, could I jump in with an additional comment here? Uh, I think everyone on the phone understands that, you know, quality, the need, the standard for quality depends on the application, the use, and the risk involved. So uh, uh, Scrum is very well suited to developing apps that are very iterative, uh, that may be updated as frequently as overnight as most of our cell phones uh, are. but on the other hand, it's not well suited for safety of life issues and, uh, you know, the control of uh, emergency braking on uh, autonomous vehicles is one of those examples where quality uh, requirements are just far, far higher than an information app on your phone that uh, doesn't have any great consequence if, uh, of safety of life if it, if it should fail, for example. So uh, the, the two are are related in that sense, but uh, quality is important, but really depends on how the system will be used. All right, thank you. And next question, Agile has been around since the U.S. Marines started uh, improvise, adapt, overcome. I would say this is a comment. Uh, presenters, any comments on that? Uh, duly noted, and it sounds like it's coming from a Marine. Positive. 
So uh, move on to the next question. The NTS consists of uh, more than 15 distinct systems operating modes. So how does the V serve all simultaneously? Uh, okay, I think I'll take that one. Uh, uh, Jack, I, I'm guessing that by NTS you mean National Transportation mm -hmm. System, and uh, that, that would include all of the transportation modes. So if my assumption there is correct, I'll say um, it really focuses uh, more on surface transportation and even a subset. As I said earlier, it definitely, uh, what we're talking about with the uh, 94011, the system engineering V process, the Scrum applications, focus heavily on uh, automobile and private vehicle transportation, on public transit buses and other public transportation services, and on uh, trucks, uh, both local and long haul trucks. Does not really cover ports and uh, uh, and maritime um, applications. Uh, it certainly does not cover what happens up in the air on FAA and pipeline, and I'm not sure what all the other 17 are uh, by memory, but uh, so it is a subset. Uh, your point's well taken. Uh, and it does not cover all transportation modes. That wasn't wasn't the intention. Uh, indeed, though, on Bill Jack seems like he has more questions now. So, uh, Jack, okay. can you uh, can you chime in? Oh. Hokey, is yeah. there? Can we see if there's anybody on the phone that's from the ITS community or surface transportation? Sure, I will. Uh, I will try to unmute all right all now. All guests so, have been uh, muted. All thank guests you. have been unmuted. All right. So anyone uh, can say anything now. <laughs> uh, this is Jack Ring. Uh, I want to emphasize that my series of questions were not meant to be competitive with what you're saying, but simply to clarify for people uh, what Agile can do, but also to be clear about what it cannot do. So uh, I'm not criticizing your work. I'm, I'm uh, being careful about things that we haven't yet addressed that are lurking out there on our highways. Uh, and for example, on the, in the last uh, issue uh, on multiple modes, uh, one transportation mode is first responders. And how does uh, what you're uh, what you're uh, describing here work uh, when we have a national emergency or a local uh, petrochemical plant explosion, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, the V model uh, can work quite well, in my view, for well-behaved systems, but I... We caution you that perhaps the V model doesn't work for designing emergency mode type systems. Say, hey, okay, uh, this is Jesse Glazer. I'll, I'll respond uh, briefly. Jack, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, the V model doesn't uh, fit all situations ideally. Uh, the um, the emergency applications that uh, that you're referring to are partially covered in the national ITS architecture, but not entirely. I think there's a lot yet to be learned on uh, how we can best respond to those kinds of, uh, I guess, chaotic situations that uh, I'm, I'm hearing you refer to. Um, so uh, we have yet to learn a lot about how to respond and how to use system engineering, and including scrum methods, uh, to better deal with those situations. We are still learning. I take your point. So well, I applaud your work, but uh, but don't oversell. Huh? Uh, and by the way, by swarm, the the picture you showed, the slide you showed very early about the uh, uh, the traffic on the San Diego freeway 20 years ago, that line of vehicles is a swarm in the autonomous world nomenclature. Right? I see. Okay. Yeah. In in the traffic engineering world, they call it a platoon, uh, but yeah. same 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 thing, different names. Thank you, Jack. Anyway, thank you for tolerating my questions. Thank you. 
Sure. Anyone in the uh, audience uh, on the phone has any questions, you can feel free to ask now. All right, I'll count to five. <laughs> um, I just, uh, there's a comment here about a tutorial, a two hour tutorial. That's not us. It must be somebody else. Tutorial from the tutorial. So, uh, well, actually, uh, Dale, yeah. Yeah, Dale has, uh, mentioned that uh, there will also be a two-hour slot in the International Symposium in July that uh, that will be on this topic. Uh, yeah, two-hour tutorial slot reserved at IS. Yeah, so uh, Dale, can you... Uh, are you still here, Dale? All right, seems like... Uh, and and that's, oh, okay. This, this, this isn't Bill, but this is Blake. Uh, we originally requested an opportunity for a tutorial that would be covered, uh, covering more than one working group. In short, not just through the twig, but through INCOSI itself on, on this subject. But, uh, that tutorial was not, uh, approved at, at with, by INCOSI at this time. So I think that may be where Dale's coming from, uh, because at one time we did tell him that we had put in the application. But uh, my fly fault if I failed to tell Dave, uh, Dale, that uh, that was not approved yet. So I, we can't guarantee that tutorial will occur. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just saw that, and I just wanted to make sure everybody knew. Yes, we, will, uh, we will follow up uh, <laughs> after this one. So, uh, yeah, so it is 11.04 uh, Central Time, 12.04 Eastern Time. So, uh, so I will end this webinar, and thank you, everyone, especially the presenters, Jesse, Barbara, and Blake, uh, for your time. And uh, this, if you want to uh, replay this meeting, it will be uploaded onto the uh, INCOSI YouTube uh, channel for TWG uh, later on. So, uh, yeah, so thank you, everyone, and uh, this meeting uh, will end now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hoki. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. Thank you.